What a great privilege it is to uh, be able to uh, open God's Word as a uh, family this morning. And this is something that God's been speaking to my heart about uh, for uh, a few weeks now, as I was leading up to uh, trying to discern what God would have me to share about what it means to be the church. I heard three words uh, pop into my mind, and those were, let faith arise. And, uh, and then the song started to play in my mind, and I, and I started to dig into that. God, what would you have me to share uh, this morning uh, that would be of some value to us as we, decide, as we discern uh, what it is to be the church? And uh, that landed in, to be the church, we need to be a faith community. Yesterday, we had the privilege of being at our uh, Brethren in Christ at AGM uh, down in Oakville, and the purpose uh, statement for the Brethren in Christ Church that they have been uh, sharing through all of their churches, and it's on the back of our bulletin if you've seen it there before, we are a growing faith community following Jesus, sharing his message, and extending his peace around the world. And so we're going to land there this morning uh, just around those two words, faith community, What does it mean to be a faith community? Last Sunday, Pastor Dave spoke about the how we can go about being the church. He he talked about community and adoration, nurture, and service. These are four things that we engage in as the body of Christ. But today I want to focus on the why. Why do we do this? And so this morning as we... I dig into scripture, and there will be a number of them, so I hope that you're great with sword drills. Um, my prayer is that our faith would be challenged, that as we leave this place, we could say, let faith arise in my heart, in the heart of our church. And so that is my prayer this morning. Let's just pray as we begin. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth and the promises that we find in it. It is so full of your goodness and your faithfulness, and God, we don't have to um, we don't have to wonder uh, about uh, how we're supposed to be the church or or why we are the church. Uh, God, you've laid that out clearly, and so this morning, as we look at uh, being a faith community, uh, God, would you challenge our hearts and our minds as we uh, look at your word? We pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. I often ask Jenna, uh, in, a, in our life, in the life of our marriage, in, in, in our individual lives before we were married, what, tell me a story. Tell me a story about faith, like a time where you really trusted God for something. You, you didn't really know the outcome. You didn't understand why you were doing it. But tell me a story about faith. And on the way home yesterday... Um, I asked her that question again. I said, share with me a faith story. If, if I say to you, what's a great faith story in your life, uh, what, where, does your, where do you instantly go? And uh, she talked about uh, just following uh, her year at Word of Life Bible Institute. Uh, she uh, was with a friend, and they had uh, come across this opportunity to work with Child Evangelism Fellowship in Alberta. And so Jenna, I don't know if you know Jenna extremely well, but she is not a uh, step out there and, you know, move across the country kind of girl. Uh, she's very uh, comfortable, and, and that's not a bad thing. That's just how God's created her to be. But her friend challenged her, let's do this together, and I really believe God's going to use this. Before that, uh, you know, her experience with child ministry was very, uh, very slim. I mean... She had really not been involved in kids' ministry much at all. And God used that step of faith uh, to ignite in her a passion for kids' ministry, which I think has been a blessing uh, to our faith community here. Uh, Similarly, at the same time, um, I was coming to a close with my ministry with Word of Life. And I had this crazy idea that uh, God was doing something in me and was taking me somewhere, and I had no idea where that was. In fact, I was fairly new to the family here at Sobel, and I didn't even know what that looked like. I remember having that conversation with Pastor Dave Opertshauser. 
So she's taking a step in this direction, and I take a step in this direction. And, um, you know, we look back on that, and we say, you know, what would have happened if we hadn't listened to the Lord? What, if, what would have happened if we hadn't been willing to take those two steps of faith in, in different directions that eventually have brought us to where we are today? And I wonder often, um, you know, those are great stories. And I often challenge myself, and I challenge uh, Jenna, like in our marriage as a couple, you know, what is God doing recently like that? You know, those are great stories, uh, and they happened, you know, maybe uh, nine years ago now. And it's not that we don't have faith stories to share, but what big moments of faith do we have that we can point to recently? And that's always a challenge. And I know a lot of the stories in this room, and I know that there are stories of great faith. And that is encouraging to me as I get to sit with you and I get to hear them. Uh, but that's what I want to challenge us with uh, this morning. What stories that um, you didn't really know the outcome or you don't really know where it's going to end up, but you're eager to see God work? What stories can you look like that uh, in your life? As people of faith, taking steps of faith should be something that's common to us. This should not be something that's foreign. We should have a whole bag of stories that we can pull from that talk about God's faithfulness. And so that's where we're headed this morning. And I really hope that the church, being a people of faith, this is a familiar message, but that today God would use something that's said to rekindle a spirit of faith within you and within us as a church and that excitement about what could be. So I want to look at a couple questions, and I've just, I've just taken some questions, and I've tried to answer them. First of all, what is faith? Uh, Pastor Dave uh, read from uh, Hebrews chapter 12 uh, this morning to, us, to start us off. Hebrews chapter 11, that is, uh, when you think about faith and the scriptures, if you want to turn there, Hebrews chapter 11 is a well-known, uh, common chapter called the faith chapter. And right at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 11... It explains to us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. In some translations, it says faith is the, is the uh, foundation or faith is the structure or the support of our hope. Uh, the Greek word that is used here is actually translated literally uh, a support. And so uh, that is the foundation of our, of our hope. It's why we are what we are, and it's why we do what we do as a church. If you think about the cans uh, analogy, the care, community adoration nurture service, I don't think that real uh, community or real adoration or real nurture or real service can happen without real faith. And so this is the foundation. It's important that we look at this as we look at being the church because it's out of our faith that we do what we do. Jesus talked a lot about faith, and we're going to look at some passages, but just to set the table for this message this morning from the start here, when Jesus talked about faith, he meant a belief that is based on the reality that he is God. He is the one that was prophesied about in the Old Testament that Moses pointed to. Uh, he is God. And that is the basis of what he says when he's talking about faith. Believing that Jesus, that God is who he said he is. And so we're going to look at John chapter 6 and beginning with the story in John chapter 6 of the feeding of the 5,000. I think there's a great lesson that we can learn uh, as we begin here. This is the only miracle that actually appears in all four of the Gospels before the crucifixion. And so I think it's an important story, and I'm sure that uh, God has lots of lessons for it, us in it. But the lesson that I want to see, uh, first of all, is that it doesn't take a ton of faith to see God do big and wonderful things. And so it says in John chapter 6, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd, verse 5, coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. 
Philip answered him, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves and gave the thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. I'm not sure who uh, is the faith hero in this story. But this is, a, this is an amazing uh, event that happened. Aside from the 5,000 men that were mentioned here, uh, scholars believe that there could have been upwards of 15,000 women and children that would have added to that number. So there is a lot of people. The disciples' plan is, it's getting late, send the people away because they're going to need something to eat. They were in a remote place outside of the village, and so it would be good to send them away so that they can reach the villages before dark, find food, and get shelter. Jesus uh, kind of asks this question, and I envision him. uh, It says that he asked this only to test his disciples. So I can imagine him looking at them and saying, hey, where are we going to find bread for all these people to eat? And, and, and just looking at their faces as they, like, what kind of a question is that? Where are we going to find bread for all these people? There's, there's thousands and thousands of people here. Peter's response, which I wouldn't say is a great uh, faith response. Sorry, Philip says, uh, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread. So his initial reaction is, like, w- this is going to take an, a, an enormous amount of money, to, even just to give them a bite of bread to eat. Uh, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, brings a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. I'm not sure whether uh, he really understood what was going to happen either. He says, you know, what, what, what is this going to do among so many people? Jesus was trying to teach them a lesson that it doesn't take a ton of faith to see God do big and wonderful things. And so he blessed the bread, and he shows them that uh, with a little faith, and when we give, some, we give what we have to the Lord, uh, he will take it and use it for his honor and for his glory. God is bigger and God is able if we have faith. What happens when we don't have faith? I want to look at a couple different um, scriptures and answer the question, why is faith important? Hebrews uh, chapter 11, again in verse 6, says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If we don't have faith, this leaves room for other traits uh, to develop in our lives that are not at all pleasing to God. And so we look at Matthew uh, chapter 8 for our first one. Matthew chapter 8. This is a familiar uh, passage as well. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Verse 23, without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping, and the disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? He got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So the disciples are still trying to figure out uh, who Jesus is. They, this caused them to ask, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus was showing that just like God in the Old Testament uh, parted the waters and controlled uh, the weather, that he was God and he was able as well. But the disciples' response, instead of faith, was fear. He says, you have little faith, why are you so afraid? Lack of faith in who God is allows fear into our lives, and living a life of fear is not pleasing to God. 
The second one we look at is Matthew chapter 16, just a few pages over. Matthew chapter 16. And starting at verse 5, we see the story of the disciples. Uh, They have just had an encounter with uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had come to test uh, Jesus and to, to try to trip him up. And so Jesus sees it as a teachable moment and wants to warn his disciples against the teaching of the Pharisees. And he uses a yeast analogy of how uh, even allowing a little bit of this teaching uh, into the mix can spread and can grow uh, into something that's not healthy. And so he uses this yeast analogy and it says, uh, he says, be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. But the disciples discussed among themselves and said, it's because we didn't bring any bread. And so they're like, why is he talking about yeast? It's probably because we forgot to bring the bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus said, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000? And how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I'm not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so when we don't have faith, uh, something that can creep into our uh, lives is this forgetfulness. We forget uh, how God has worked in the past and how uh, he is faithful. And we forget who God is. We forget that that he is able, he is powerful, he is, he is bigger than any of our situations that we might think uh, are just too big, and God is bigger, and we forget that sometimes. We forget about what God has done and what he is able to do. This can paralyze us and make us not act. This, as well, is not pleasing to God. The third thing that I think creeps in when we... Uh, don't have faith, and it's just a couple pages back, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, at verse 53. Jesus goes to his hometown, and he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all of his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all of these things? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And so I think that one thing, another thing that creeps into uh, our lives or is present in our lives when we lack faith is missed opportunities. It goes on to finish that part in verse 58. He did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So not acknowledging Jesus as who he is, uh, these people said, uh, this is just the carpenter's son. This is, we know this guy. We, we, his brothers are here. His sisters are here. It's just Joseph's boy. You know, how does he, how does he do this stuff? They reduced him uh, to just a carpenter's son. And he was a carpenter's son, but he was so much more than that, and they missed this. And it squashed the opportunities for Jesus to do amazing miracles in their midst. This is not pleasing to God. On the flip side of this, the Gospels are riddled with examples where because of people's faith, Jesus did do amazing things. Matthew chapter 8 and 9 uh, have uh, quite a few of them just in those uh, couple chapters. There was a man with leprosy who knelt before Jesus and said, Jesus, if you're willing. And Jesus says, I'm willing. And he was healed. The centurion had a sick servant who was paralyzed. Jesus wanted to go to his house. The centurion says, I'm not worthy that you would enter my house. If you just say the word, he will be healed. What faith. Jesus was amazed at his faith. That's the only time that it says Jesus was amazed by the faith of this person. 
the paralytic in chapter 9 who was healed because of the faith of his friends who brought him to Jesus on a mat, the woman who bled for 12 years and reached out and touched just the hem of his, gar- of his garment, the, the edge of his cloak, what faith, and she was healed. The dead girl that was brought to life because of the faith of her father that ran to Jesus to get him. Now, this next one takes real faith. Two blind men followed him. Now, that's a challenge. Two blind men followed him. And uh, because of their faith, Jesus said, according to your faith, will it be done to you? God is not pleased when we allow fear or forgetfulness or mi- and missed opportunities to be our life pattern in place of faith. Our God is a good father, and he wants to do wonderful and miraculous things in our lives. Well, that's wonderful. So we see that faith is important. But sometimes I don't feel like I have great faith. So how do I increase that in my life? And so our next question is, where does faith come from? And we look at Ephesians 2, and we get a better understanding of where faith comes from. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says, Faith is a gift from God. It's a picture of His grace to us. It isn't something that we earn on our own, something that we have earned so we can brag about it. It's something that God gives to us. The only reason that we have any faith at all is because God has granted it to us as a gift. Earlier in that chapter, it tells us that God gives us the gift of faith because of His great love for us. Hebrews chapter 12 that Pastor Dave read says, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. So what do you do if you're lacking faith? Well, first of all, read God's Word. We need to be in the Word of God that will produce faith in us. This is our primary source. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God produces faith in us, whether that's uh, listening to a message or studying at home on your own. Uh, We always encourage people to be involved in life groups. Uh, This is a great way that you can receive and you can understand and learn and grow in God's Word in a community of people. Uh, This is where we get our increase of faith, when we hear God's Word. It builds faith in us. This is why we must live the Great Commission, telling of what God has done, sharing God's Word. We are bringing faith to people. It doesn't matter how well you speak or how much education you have or whether you know your Bible as well as the next person. Sharing the story of Jesus is the way that God has chosen to give this gift of faith out. Hebrews chapter 11, this faith chapter, is a great one to read. And it it tells us stories after stories of faith throughout history. We need to remember the times that God has seen us through. Like the disciples, sometimes we forget what God has done. So be in God's word. Remember that God is faithful. Remember the times when God has been faithful in your life. And seek God and ask him to give you an increase of faith. We can pray for increased faith. Luke chapter 11 uh, tells us that God gives all things that are good to those who, who ask. And so we can ask for this increased faith. Uh, Jesus told Peter in Luke 22 that he was praying for him that his faith would not fail. So oftentimes I wonder uh, if I need more faith or if I just need to be exercising and using the faith that I have a little more and seeing it grow. But what do we do once we have faith? What do we do with it? James 2 verse 17 says, Faith without works is dead. Faith should compel us to action. It isn't an action word, but it is a word of action. And so we look at the stories in Hebrews 11 where they took action. They did things because of their faith, because they understood and they knew 
who God was, they took action. This is still how it needs to be today. We need to be people of action because we believe that God is who he said he is. And like any gift from God, it's our responsibility to exercise this gift. If you don't want to use it, or if you don't use it, you lose it. That's, an off, that's a common saying. And I think that applies to our faith as well. But if you use it and you exercise it and you take steps of faith and it grows and it becomes more a part of who you are and a part of who we are as a community. Mountain moving faith is something that we cultivate. It's something that we grow. It doesn't happen instantly. James says if you have faith but you aren't doing anything with it, then really what good is it? 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we live by faith and not by sight. We don't live by what we see the world lives. We live by faith. We believe and we have hope in our God. So what does it look like to practically live a life of faith as an individual? As a follower of Christ, uh, that is first and foremost. I follow Jesus. He is the beginning and the end to my faith. It's all about Him because I believe that God is who He said He is and I know what He wants. I seek heavenly wisdom and direction from the Holy Spirit. I I often say to my wife, if you get a sense that you should do something and it's completely opposite of what the world would think makes sense, you're probably on the right track. And I think that uh, there's some wisdom to be used in that, but we need to be willing to take risks when the world says that this doesn't make any sense. I think God sometimes asks us to step out in faith without knowing the outcome, without knowing the direction. It makes me to be a person of prayer. I take all things in my natural life before a supernatural God who loves me and wants the best for me. I live one day at a time, but with an eternal perspective in mind. Thanking God for the time that he's given me, but trusting him with whatever the future holds. I understand that everything I am and have comes from God and belongs to God. And so I'm a steward of his possessions. I give to those in need. I support the local part of the body of Christ that I'm committed to. And I get my self-worth and my identity in who God has created me to be, not from what the world tries to tell me I need to be. I love people and I do what I can to live at peace with everyone because I understand that God loves them and died for them just as much as he did for me. These are the neighbors that are around me. These are those who I shop with. Uh, These are anybody that God brings across our path. I do what I can to fulfill the Great Commission, talking about Jesus when I get the opportunity and sharing his message. I seek the fruit of the Spirit to be super evident in my life. All of them, not just one or two. I desire all of them. How do we live this faith out in community? It's a fact that churches without faith don't last Pastor Dave talked about these four things last week. Community, uh, where we start, is where we learn about faith and act it out together. There's a safety in taking risks and listening to God in a family of people that love each other and want to see each other succeed in living out their faith. Showing grace and patience and love, whether we fail or succeed. Maybe it's leading a life group for the first time, teaching a class, being a part of the worship team. These are areas where you can step out in faith and serve and be a part of the family and do that surrounded by people who love you. We live out our faith in community through adoration. We follow Jesus together. We are his bride. Everything we do and, and everything we are needs to be about him and for him. When we come together, uh, we put our preferences aside. 
We were talking about this at our young adults group on Tuesday night, and we had uh, a great, uh, large group, 27 young adults packed in our basement. We were talking about uh, Pastor Dave's message last Sunday, and when we talked about adoration, one of our young adults said um, that it's our responsibility to show up on a Sunday morning already filled so that we're ready to pour out and to pour into others. If Sunday morning is the only place where we come to be filled and to receive, then we're missing the point of what the church is. We come with hearts of adoration, ready and to pour out and to uh, serve each other for Jesus. We live out faith by seeking nurture. We learn together. We study God's word. We discern his voice through it together. We do this in our life groups. It's, it's a part of who we are. We discern God's word together. We allow God's spirit to speak through us collectively as a group. We live out our faith in service. We serve Jesus together. We all need to have an active role in our church and be committed to serving each other because we do it out of a heart of service to Jesus. And I've heard every excuse in the book about why you don't serve. Uh, and, you know, that's what life is about. That's what living a life of faith is about. It's living a life of devotion to Jesus, and it's learning to serve each other. We each sacrifice equally our time, our talents, our abilities. Not always equal contribution, but equal sacrifice. We have vision for the future. We celebrate the past. We recognize our current situation, but we see it and look towards what God would have for us, which we know is growth. God's plan for the church is always growth. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We have to have faith that he's going to continue to see the good work here through. If we believe that our best days are behind us and that God can't take us to higher ground, then we are in trouble. We live out the Great Commission together. We strive to be a church that is open and active to our community, not separated, not uninterested in what's happening around us, but focused, just focused on what is best for us, but loving our neighbor as ourselves, having a heart for the community and ministry. We pray together. We live out our faith by coming together to pray together. It's how we link arms and we hold each other up. We lift each other's natural trials and temptations to the supernatural God as instructed in his word. We anoint with oil as an act of faith. We celebrate together baptisms, child dedications, people joined together in marriage. We remember lives of faith that were lived well, that have graduated to glory. We observe communion together. We do these things in faith because of who God is. But all of these things are faith steps. They're all faith actions. This is why we do what we do. To be the church, we need to be a faith community. And because we have faith, we are a people of action. A number of years ago when we uh, first uh, began to fundraise for this building, I wasn't here. I came after all the work was done. But the, the campaign that they used was called Forward by Faith. And I, that's been on my heart all week. And I've been thinking, that's not just a one-time thing. That's not just a season of our church that we, we step forward in faith for a couple months here or a couple months there. That is That needs to be our heart's desire as a church constantly, that we're always moving forward by faith. What are you believing God for right now? For yourself, for your family, for your church? Are there steps of faith that you can take as you look for God to work? Are there areas of unbelief in your heart? I want to see us be a growing faith community, but I also want to see us be a faith-growing community that acts this out and does this together, and that in this place, faith 
arises. God says, I am the great I am. That means he was and he is and he always will be. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And this is why we do what we do. This is why, as a church, we are a community of faith. Because we know who God is. We know that he's faithful. We know that he's able. And so we move forward together by faith. Let's just pray. God, thank you for, uh, for this message. God, thank you for how you've been challenging my heart. God, I would pray that uh, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit of God would be saying uh, to us individually and to us as a church. God, we, we want to follow you, but we know that following you means action. It means taking steps towards what you have uh, for us. But God, we need you to lead. It's all for you. It's all for your glory. God, we worship you and we praise you because you alone are worthy of that. And we are a people of faith. We are a community of faith, of following Jesus because you alone are true and are worth following. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.